Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to the analysis of Union Budget 2023 organized by Will GST and Tax Connect. I would like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Vivek Jalan. Mr. Vivek Jalan is qualified chartered accountant, qualified LLM and LLP. He is the chairperson of the indirect tax core group of the CII. Also, he is the chairperson of the Fiscal Affairs Committee of BCCNI. He is the regular speaker of various professionals forum on the key area of direct and indirect taxes. During the session, please put your video and microphone off. If anyone has any query, please write in the chat box. We will answer all your queries at the end of the session. Now I request uh, Sami sir uh, from Will GST address the August gathering. Hi, good morning to everyone. Jo thank you for joining us for uh, on this very special uh, budget webinar conducted by Wheel GST and uh, Tax Connect. Uh, Vivek, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yesterday budget uh, in many terms, uh, in many ways, it was uh, uh, quite landmark, uh, especially the direct taxes part. Uh, so, you see, the budget speech was uh, uh, not very long. Normally, the budget speech goes up to even up to two o'clock, but yesterday it was uh, it ended at around twelve thirty or so. So, the basically what I'm trying to say is the details, the the the, the details of the budget is in the fine print. So, uh, so Vivek will help us understand those and navigate those fine prints and take us through both the direct taxes and indirect taxes part and their implications. So I think there are quite a few uh, 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 notable changes and amendments and uh, which was, has implication on personal taxation, corporate taxation and indirect taxes as well. So so take us to take us through all these changes, I, I invite Vivek to start the proceeding and uh, uh, start with the this webinar. So over to Vivek. Vivek. Uh, please uh, continue from uh, from here. And uh, if, there, if there is a if there are questions and if you have some queries, you can uh, I like quickly said uh, we you can have it in the chat box or at the end of the session you can unmute yourself and ask those questions directly to Vivek. So over to you, Vivek. Yeah, uh, thank you, Samir, and uh, thank you, Mushmi. Good morning to everybody, and thank you to all the participants for joining immediately after the budget day. And uh, we have kept it uh, at uh, nine o'clock this webinar, so that uh, just you know you will start uh, post budget, and uh, in case you go to your offices. Uh, most of us are finance or tax professionals, then, uh, you know, people would have queries from us and, and to understand the fine prints. Also, in case uh, we are consultants already, we would have got uh, calls from across as to what is the impact of the clients in their sectors, etc. So, uh, we will discuss uh, in detail the fine prints of this budget. As always, uh, now indirect taxes uh, have lost most of its relevance, especially as far as GST is concerned in the budget, because uh, most of the decisions are taken by the GST Council and uh, the amendment to the CGST IGST Act that is done in the budget every year. So we, it was almost predictable. However, there is still a very, very big surprise in GST in this budget. We will discuss that threadbare and uh, whether uh, or not, uh, you know, that will prevail, whether it would be challenged in the courts or not. Direct tax has seen uh, a lot of changes uh, and uh, as expected, personal taxes have seen a lot of uh, amendments and relaxations. But then again, that is not uh, free flow. It is subject to certain uh, restrictions and a certain vision of the government going forward. So we will discuss uh, that. I will share my presentation. Thank you. 
Iya. Uh, Moshmi, is the presentation visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Visible. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, you see, <clears throat> before starting, let us uh, understand the macro budget. Finance professionals primarily are more interested in taxation proposals, which we will discuss, but just, you know, an understanding of uh, the budget financials and where tax proposals fit in and whether going forward in the next financial year, the collection drive would be aggressive or whether it would be subdued, subdued considering so many elections, etc. That is also understood a little bit from the budget financials, which is available in budget at a glance. So, uh, the budget economics is marked by two important announcements and two important, uh, you know, macroeconomic factors. First of all, is uh, the major announcement of capital expenditure being hiked up to 10 lakh crores. You see, for a common man, 10 lakh crores uh, would not matter uh, so much or mean so much. But if I tell you 10 lakh crores means around 25% of the entire expenditure of the entire government of India in the financial year 23-24, that means something. So, the government is intending to spend 25% of its revenue in capital expenditure in the ensuing year, amounting to 10 lakh crores and 3.3% of GDP. Friends, uh, this is uh, the highest till now which the governments have done in at least the last 20 years or so, where I think all of us have started seeing the budget in detail. Where does this kind of money come from? And mind that, another thing is that even after spending so much of money, the fiscal deficit, what is fiscal deficit? It is the amount of expenditure which is more than the revenues. The fiscal deficit is 5.9% which is less than the last year. So, the government will borrow lesser than the last year and it will spend more this year. How does this happen? This happens mainly from tax revenues, which is around 27 lakh crores. What are the tax revenues? Primarily, two tax revenues are there, direct taxes and indirect taxes. Direct taxes revenues are estimated at 18.2 lakh crores, which is a hike of 28% over the last budgeted estimates. I'm not talking about the revised estimates, right? So, over the last budget estimate, this year's budget estimate of direct taxes, including corporate tax and personal tax, is jacked up by 28%. And the GST revenue expected is jacked up by around 23-24%. This is a, a major collection target, especially in the last year of this uh, government uh, in this uh, session. Therefore, we, while we were expecting that uh, maybe the recovery and collection drives may ease out, it may not be so completely because to achieve a excess of uh, revenue of around 25%, including direct and indirect taxes, would take some doing from the field formations. So now let us see how the finance minister wants to achieve this kind of revenues and from where she will get the money from. First and foremost, 
something which uh, all of us have been hearing from uh, yesterday. We have prepared an analysis of uh, the amendments in the personal taxes and we have taken three slabs of uh, estimated income of those who want to go into the new scheme after the amendment which was made yesterday. So, what were the four major amendments in personal taxes made? Mind that a word in here, all the amendments in personal taxes were proposed only for those taxpayers who are in the new regime. There is no amendment, no further relaxation, while no relaxation has been taken away per se also, but there is no relaxation in personal taxes for those taxpayers who are in the old regime. For the taxpayers in the new regime, there are four relaxations. First, the maximum limit up to which no taxes are required to be paid in the new regime has been increased from 5 lakh to 7 lakh rupees. But that has been done through 87A route. That is the rebate route, right? I will explain in detail, right? We will take, uh, you know, 10 minutes of uh, here in the personal taxes before we get into the major announcements of corporate taxes. So, the tax slabs in the new regime were 0 to 2.5 lakh exempt, 2.5 to 5, 5%, 5 to 7.5, 10%, 7.5 to 10 lakh rupees of income. It was uh, 15%. 10 to 12.5, 20%, 12.5 to 15 lakhs, it was 25% and more than 15 lakh, the tax rate was 30%. Now, these tax slabs have been rationalized to make 6 tax slabs into 5. How does it happen? By removing the 25% tax slabs. So, on your screen, you can see 2.5 lakh to 5 lakh, that becomes 3 to 6 lakh. So, 0 to 3 lakhs becomes uh, exempt. 3 to 6 lakhs is uh, 5%. 6 to 9 lakhs is uh, 10%. 9 to 12 lakh is 15%. 12 to 15 lakh is uh, 20%. And more than 15 lakhs income tax slab is 30%. So, 25% has been done away with. Third, for salaried taxpayers, there is an announcement of introduction of standard deduction even under the new regime. Previously, there was no standard deduction under the new regime. And fourth amendment, for those under the new regime is the highest surcharge rate for those with taxable income of more than 5 crores at the rate of 37% has been done away with. So, for the new regime, the highest surcharge rate is 25% for those with a taxable income of more than 2 crores of rupees. However, for the old regime, the same surcharge of 37% still exists. So, these are the four important uh, amendments in the new regime. The new regime becomes a default regime, which makes it very, very clear the intention of the government is that going forward, the old regime would be done away with. However, the new regime would take the form of a hybrid regime kind of. Previously, there was no deductions under the new regime. Now, there are three deductions. 
standard deduction, a new deduction for family pension, and a deduction for contribution to Agni Weed scheme. There is a new scheme for corporate donation to Agni Weed scheme, right? For the new Agni Weed scheme, where the people would be recruited for the RV, they would donate some money. Government would donate and thereafter, after four years, in case they are not even absorbed in the army, then they would be paid off. So that donation that will be subject to a deduction in the new tax regime. So possibly maybe one or two more deductions might come in the new tax regime. But going forward, it shows the intention of the government to do away with the old regime and keep the new regime with maybe certain more amendments. So now let us understand. In case your taxable income is 9 lakh rupees, then as per the new regime, the current slab, 2.5 to 5 lakh, etc., your total tax, oh, there is a mistake here, the total tax in case your taxable income is 9 lakh would come to 60,000 rupees, right, on your screen. 7.5 to 9 lakh, it should be 22,500. So, in case your total income is 9 lakh rupees, your total tax would come to 60,000 rupees for non-salary taxpayers. However, with the new tax slabs, it would be 45,000 rupees. So, there is a saving of around 25% as far as tax expenditure is concerned as per new tax levels. Now, let us look at in case your uh, income is 15.5 lakh rupees, then as per the current tax levels in the new regime itself, the tax would be 2 lakh 2,500 rupees. However, with the new slabs, it would be 1,65,000. So, there is a saving of 37,500 rupees. But please wait. In case you are a salaried person, then you would be getting an additional benefit of standard deduction of what? 50,000 rupees. So, there would be an additional benefit of 30% of 50,000 rupees which is 15,000 rupees. Therefore, in case you are a salaried person and uh, you are into uh, the new regime, you would be benefiting in case your total income, your salary is more than 15.5 lakh rupees, you would be saving 52,500 rupees vis-a-vis -vis the old regime or old uh, tax labs. That is around a 25% benefit in the tax expenditure. This is the benefit of the new tax labs in the new regime itself as per the proposal by the finance minister in the budget which was uh, declared yesterday. Now, the question comes that in case the new regime would be the default regime. Then there was a form 10 IE to be filled up <coughs> to choose the <coughs> regime. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the question is whether that form would still be required to be filled in or not when the new tax uh, regime becomes the default regime or not, that requires to be seen. Association of person, body of individuals, they are also brought into the new tax regime. So, for them, the same form needs to be filled because the option is still available to <clears throat> take the benefit of the old tax regime. Also, a major amendment in leave encashment under 1010A. So, leave and cashment threshold has been in increased from 3 lakh to 25 lakh rupees. Prima facie, it might seem as unbelievable. From 3 lakh rupees, the threshold exemption has gone up to 25 lakh rupees. But mind that the <coughs> Ministry of Finance, they deal in numbers 
of tax revenues and they have seen that the impact is not so much. Furthermore, the threshold of leave encashment of 3 lakh was uh, fixed in 2002. And so after 20 years, it has been made uh, 25 lakh, taking an inflation rate of uh, average of 4 to 5%. So this is not a very, very absurd or astonishing number, right? Well, there was some confusion on the valuation of perquisite in case of rent free accommodation in case the accommodation was owned or in case the accommodation was rented out by the employer itself. Now it is uh, proposed to bring in the consistency in the valuation of the rent free accommodation. Yeah, so somebody is asking what about NPS? So no deduction of NPS also under the new tax regime, right? Only three deductions under the new tax regime, standard deduction for salaried, family pension scheme, and this Agni Weird scheme, right? This is something which uh, we have just found in the morning while I was browsing through the various websites. Uh, you see, somebody has done this analysis. I thought of just sharing it with uh, you. I saw it prima facie, it looked to be a uh, well, made analysis, we will share this PPT. You see many of your uh, employers or many of your clients would ask you whether uh, to go for old tax regime or new tax regime, etc. Then uh, you can share this uh, in case deemed fit. As per this analysis, from what I can see is also fine. Still the old tax regime, in case you plan for ATC, investment in case you plan for NPS investment under the old tax regime, in case you plan for ATD, health insurance premium, in case you take all of these deductions, then the old tax regime still is more lucrative, right? For those who are settled in the, uh, you know, tax regime, they who are matured uh, taxpayers, However, you see, as your income level goes up, then the saving in the old tax regime goes uh, down and it becomes just around 8,000 rupees. Uh, and uh, this 8,000 rupees would take care by itself in case, you know, you do not have to maintain documents and do so many compliances in the new tax regime. However, yes, for those new taxpayers or new P, uh, PP, you know, young people who have just come into the employment whose uh, salaries or income is less than 7 lakh rupees per annum, of course, the new tax regime is much, much better now. So, a shift to the new tax regime, I think almost all the new taxpayers, the new young people coming into the tax brackets, they would be shifting into the new tax regime and possibly in one or two years, all of us who are in old tax regime, you have to shift into the new tax regime going forward. Yeah, uh, so 15% uh, tax, uh, just a second. Yeah, so 15% tax uh, bracket, uh, at par with the companies for new manufacturing, cooperative societies also has been uh, announced yesterday in the budget. Just to make it at par with the new manufacturing companies, the cooperative societies, they are also bought in at par. And in case you set up a new cooperative societies for manufacturing purposes after 1st of April 2023, you can take the benefit of uh, 15% tax slab, of course, after surcharge and uh, education says that would uh, go up. There are other benefits for uh, cooperative societies, specifically the sugar cooperative societies. Now, what was happening in the sugar cooperative societies was that uh, you see a uh, MSP for sugar uh, purchase uh, was uh, fixed, is fixed by the government. However, the cooperative societies pay more than the MSPs and they were claiming the deduction for 
whatever payment they were making for the purchase, the assessing officers have disallowed the expenditure prior to 1st April 2016 before the act was amended. And uh, now it is proposed that uh, all amendments have, will be passed in the act so as to limit the deduction to the extent of MSPs for the purchase of the sugar by the cooperative societies. Relaxations for cooperative societies from 194 N, wherein the, the limit of TDS under 194 N is uh, 1 crore rupees for others for cash withdrawal. Now for cooperative societies, it has become 2 crores of rupees. So there are some relaxations for cooperative societies in this budget. Well, uh, for all of you, a major amendment in line with uh, second provision to 16.2 of uh, GST somewhat. So, as what, what is second provision to 16.2 under GST Act, in case you do not pay to your suppliers within uh, 180 days, then you have to reverse the input tax credit so availed on such supplies. A similar provision uh, has been brought under section 43B of the Income Tax Act by this budget. Please uh, understand carefully, right? This is not as simple as GST, you know, like always. Direct taxes, you know, are more minute uh, than, uh, you know, indirect taxes somewhere. So, the provision is that uh, in case you as a recipient, right, purchase certain goods or services from those suppliers who are under MSME scheme, they are registered as MSME, then there can be three situations, right? Number one, you have an agreement with the supplier and as per the agreement, the credit period is less than 45 days, right? Number two, you have an agreement with your supplier, but as per the terms of the payment or the credit period with the supplier is more than 45 days. Number three, you do not have an agreement for the payment or the credit period with your suppliers. Right? So, number one, in case you have an agreement with your suppliers for a credit period and as per the agreement, the credit period is less than 45 days. Then, you get a deduction for the payment on accrual basis only in case you make the payment within the reduced credit period. So, in case you have an agreement to pay your supplier who is registered as an MSME within 30 days and you do not pay within 30 days but you pay after 40 days. So, you will get the deduction of such expenditure on payment basis only. That is, after 40 days, when you make the payment, you will get the deduction. You have an agreement, second situation. You have an agreement with your supplier and the credit period is more than 45 days. You will get a deduction on payment basis if you pay after 45 days or accrual basis if you pay within 45 days which is allowed as per section 15 of the MSME Act. Right? You do not have a credit period as per terms of agreement with your MSME supplier, you have to pay within 15 days to claim the expenditure on a 
accrual basis. Friends, most important is that Proviso 243B, which allows you as a deduction if payment is made without, before the due date of the pay return filing date, that is not applicable to this section 43BH. So, when you are closing your accounts, right, you have to be very careful now. On 31st of March, you have to scrutinize as to what is the dues from the MSMEs. And in case you violate any of the conditions 1, 2, 3, then you have to add back the deduction taken on account of payment to MSMEs against or in violation of section 15 of the MSME Act. This is a very, very important development and uh, we should all uh, inculcate this in our uh, finance and our commercial operations going forward. I think we should, uh, you know, spread the message in our accounts department very soon. Once the Finance Act is approved, this provision would uh, be implemented from 1st of April 2023 itself. Startups. There are three relaxations for startups registered under 80 IAC as per section 80 IAC registered as startups. First, as always, the due date for incorporation of a startup for taking the benefit of uh, ATIAC has been extended by one more year. It has been happening over the last few budgets. So it has been extended for one more year to 1st April 2024. Number two, as per ATIAC, the relief deduction as a deduction was uh, available to the startups for losses incurred for three years in a span of seven years. Now that seven years has been extended to 10 years. So for startups who are under 80 IAC, they would get the deduction for uh, losses. They would get the relief for losses incurred for three years in a span of any 10 years from the date of the incorporation, right? And third, there is a condition that this uh, benefit would be available only in case 51% uh, or more of the shareholding is uh, continued. Now that has been uh, relaxed, that 51% has been relaxed subject to the fact that all the shareholders of the company continue to hold the shares in the companies. So if the shareholders who started this startup, they do not dilute their shares, they do not sell their shares, then uh, even if the corresponding shareholding gets reduced even lesser than 15%, 51%, even then the benefit of ATIAC would not uh, be gone. Right. Uh, there are some messages that voice is not clear. Uh, Moshmi, is my voice clear? Yes, sir, it is clear. Clear, okay. Okay, participants are saying it is clear. So kindly check your bandwidth at your end. I think uh, possibly that needs some adjustment. Conversion of gold to gold receipts, right? Or reconversion of gold receipts to gold. Three reliefs for conversion of gold to gold receipt or reconversion of electronic gold receipt to gold. Number one, they would not be, the conversion would not be considered to be as a transfer. 
right? So no capital gain on conversion of gold to gold receipt, electronic gold receipt or vice versa. Number two, cost of acquisition of the original gold should be considered as cost of acquisition of the electronic gold receipt. So those who have got the gold as a gift, there would be zero. The cost of acquisition would be considered to be as zero, right? And the holding period of the original gold, that would be considered to be the holding period of the, or included in the holding period of the electronic gold receipt and vice versa. So three amendments for conversion of gold to electronic gold receipts and vice versa. And uh, this is a relief and uh, it was much expected uh, because this was creating a big anomaly. Friends, we all know that after the Supreme Court judgment in case of Ahmedabad Urban Development Society, now all the trusts who are claiming exemption under 1023C or 12A, you know, they are uh, under a dilemma. While I am not aware that in case any trust or such a institution has received any query, but uh, as per the Supreme Court's judgment, in case a commercial activity is done for profit, then the exemption for at least that part of the activity would uh, not be available for trusts under 12A or 1023C, including NGOs, non-for-profit organizations, etc. Now, the Honorable Apex Court has uh, clarified that uh, those authorities or board or bodies or trusts or commissions who are not for profit and who are for public services, right? They would not be entailed under the mischief of commercial activity. So they would not, they would keep on getting the exemption. However, still a new section 1046A has been uh, introduced and proposed in this budget, carve out a exemption for such bodies, authorities, etc., like this Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority. Now, we will see what would be the further developments in this. <clears throat> there are a lot of developments under the trust. And uh, yesterday I was looking at in case there is any proposal to, you see, bring in clarity post this Supreme Court's judgment in the case of Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority. So as to what would come under the mischief of commercial activity for all the other trusts, but there was nothing as such for those, but a carve out has been done for the authorities and the public services enterprises, which may pave the way for queries for whether all the continuing trusts, whatever trusts are continuing, whether they fall under the mischief of commercial activity or not. Right? So, it is very important, friends. Uh, you see, we have been uh, litigating for many of the trusts, non-government organizations, uh, where the authorities have alleged that, you know, so even if so small uh, profit is made in activities, you see, like, uh, you know, any sponsorship is taken, you cannot have a no-profit sponsored event. You cannot even estimate what would be the cost of a sponsored event. So... After the Supreme Court's judgment in Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority, all of these trusts, they would require to be structured, right? And these, uh, the, uh, the, the CBDT has again re-clarified from the Supreme Court that this would be continued to be always applicable. So you have to see your current position and assess your risks 
as in your current organizations in case you are an ngo or a non for profit organization whether registered as a company under section 25 or as a trust or uh, any other form for new companies uh, deduction under uh, 35d for preliminary expenditure is available in 10 years and right uh, there are a list of expenditures however for those expenditures like preparation of feasibility report uh, project report market survey engineering services etc the provision is that uh, those uh, institutions who would be doing these activities under 35 da 2a they would be notified by the cbdt now this is a very good relief no need of any notification right uh, of the authority or the, the the service provider who will do all these activities to take a deduction under 35d no need to approach the authorities now in case you have incurred such an expenditure you can claim it under 10 branches in the next 10 years under 35d as a deduction for preliminary expenditure what you have to do is once you complete that activity once you start taking the deduction then there would be a format which would be prescribed you have to self certify such expenditure with the corresponding evidences and you can start claiming the deduction right this is a relief and uh, I would say it is uh, ease in the compliances. For uh, MSMEs and uh, small professionals, right? Uh, the benefit of presumptive uh, taxation would be available for uh, MSMEs whose uh, turnover now is less than three crores. So previously the threshold limit for uh, 44 AD presumptive tax benefit was uh, 2 crores. It has been increased uh, or proposed to be increased to 3 crores. 44 ADA for professionals from 50 lakh, this limit has been uh, proposed to be increased to 75 lakhs. It would be applicable from the next financial year and the assessment year 24 25 itself. So, uh, relief for all of those uh, or all your clients who are uh, under the normal scheme they can opt, opt for a presumptive scheme now now this is very interesting now we all know that uh, gift which is made to a resident more than 50000 rupees that is taxable under 56 to 10, right? However, now what happens is that uh, in case such uh, gift is made to a person who is in India, residing in India in this year. However, because of his non-residential status for 9 out of 10 years or, you know, 729 days, he is resident, but not ordinarily resident. He has returned to India, stayed in India more than 182 days, but uh, he is a resident and not ordinarily resident, right? And uh, in case the gift of more than 50,000 rupees is made to him, that uh, would uh, not be taxable under 56 to 10. This has been brought under the tax net now under 917 by the amendment to include residents and not ordinarily resident to whom gift is made more than 50,000 in a financial year. Very, very important amendment. In fact, uh, I still remember this uh, 5627B. In fact, uh, there are so many cases. In fact, it is a weird uh, case now we are uh, you know arguing before the honorable ITAT delhi under 5627b we all know that uh, 5627b requires that in case uh, shares are issued or share application money is received uh, at a value which is more than the face value of the 
shares to a resident then the excess of such value which is charged over the face value that would be considered to be as an income right under 5627b now this provision specifically was not applicable to non residents and the authorities they took a roundabout way of uh, passing ex parte orders etc etc in the inst in one of the cases you know we are arguing the penal order right? we are arguing the main order who where the commissioner appeal commissioner appeals has uh, denied this uh, benefit of 5627b being not applicable to a non resident just because of the time barring period for filing of the appeal however when the penalty order has uh, come he has provided relief for the penalty order because the person against whom such uh, 5627b was sought to be imposed was a non resident right so main order confirmed because of time barring provision penalty order relief is given department has gone into a uh, you know appeal to the itat on the penalty order all of these disputes under 5627b being not applicable to non residents and going ahead and proving non residential status that is sought to be put to rest from 1st of april 2023 by applying 5627b even to non residents right so now even if share is uh, issued at more than face value to non residents right or uh, share application money is taken from non residents over a value then uh, 5627b would uh, apply repayment of uh, debt by business trust to the unit holders now we all know that uh, a special uh, pass through scheme was uh, introduced wherein uh, for uh, business trust like real estate trust investment trust etc wherein in case an spv was giving a dividend or a interest right to a business trust it would be passed through the business trust and it would be taxable in the hands of the unit holders now uh, what was happening in was that a debt repayment which was actually the surplus generated by the business trust in case that was uh, distributed amongst the unit holders that was considered to be as exempt on the unit holders now that the story has been sought to put to rest in this budget by i feel rightfully taxing even the debt repayment which is actually in the form of distribution of surplus by the business trust to the unit holders the taxability would be in the hands of the unit holders just like interest dividend rent etc debentures listed debentures now two very very important uh, developments right we would discuss both when we are on this topic from uh, 1st april 2023 even in case you have uh, invested in a listed security or debenture right tds under section 193 would be applicable because it was uh, considered by the cbdt that uh, since tds was not applicable on such uh, deben listed debentures uh, there was under reporting by the recipients of the interest for such debentures right so the listed companies who have uh, 
sub, you know, taken the investment in such debentures, they would now require to deduct EDS. Well, uh, very, very important. Structured product game is now over. What was a structured product? It was a market link debenture, which was uh, introduced as structured product by many of the fund houses and NBFCs. While they were issuing debentures, they were linking the returns of such debentures with the market. So primarily for uh, this uh, market linked debentures, no TDS was uh, liable to be deducted, right, on the income. So now TDS would be deducted under 193. And uh, they were getting the benefit of the capital gains at a lower rate. LTCG, STCG was considered as a lower rate. Now, it has been provided to introduce a new section 50 double A, wherein these market link debentures, even if they are sold after one year, three years, whatever be the holding period, the gain on the sale of such market link debentures, or you might call it unstructured product, that would always be considered to be short term capital gain taxable at such rates uh, as per STCG rate at slab rates. So, it was very, very important uh, amendment. I think now we have to see whether these structured products in the background of this uh, amendment that uh, these structured debentures or structured product or market link debentures still continue to be attractive or not. TDS on online gaming, a new provision of 194BA is introduced wherein TDS at the rate of 30% is uh, now applicable on the net winnings. So, amount received minus amount lost, amount gained minus amount lost in online gaming on the net winnings. In case you withdraw such amount of the net winnings, then TDS would be applicable at 30% when you are making the withdrawal. In case you do not withdraw that at the end of the year, TDS would be applicable on the amount standing at net winnings in your account. Mind that it would be applicable on both cash and kind portions. And the same provision wherein in case the cash portion is less than the kind portion, still TDS has to be deducted before payment of the kind portion to the recipient of such net winnings. Mind that a new penal clause has been brought in for all of these TDS to be deducted on kind portion, including 194R, 194S, now 194BA. So, wherever now you have to pay or deduct TDS on kind portion also, and where the cash is not sufficient, and you fail to deduct TDS on the kind portion before devolving the cash portion, then penalty as well as prosecution provisions would be applicable on you as a deductor. So, tedious provisions as always, they always have a surprise in the fine prints of the budget. One more uh, amendment in the TCS is a higher rate of TCS. Now, last year in uh, uh, section 206C1G, a TCS was proposed at the rate of 0.5% on uh, loan taken for the uh, LRS, uh, foreign uh, remittance under LRS done for loan taken for educational purposes uh, under ATE. 
or other educational purposes tcs was under 0.5% or 5% in case a loan was taken at uh, more than 7 lakhs even for medical purposes uh, it was applicable at 5% in case such foreign remittance or under liberalized remittance scheme was uh, made of more than uh, 7 lakh rupees that will continue so tds at 0.5 or 5% on these would continue over 7 lakh rupees in case of foreign remittance under lrs however for all other remittances under lrs including store package or under any other case tds would tcs would be 20% and not 5%. For tour package, there is no limit to TCS from rupee 1 from 1st April 2023. For foreign tours, you have to pay TCS at the rate of 20% now on LRS, the foreign remittances, mind that. However, for any other LRS, you have to pay TCS at the rate of 20% only after the threshold limit of 7 lakhs of rupees. So, uh, the government is clearly de-incentivizing foreign travel, right, under foreign tour package. It is de-incentivizing foreign remittances, right. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a huge uh, liability of TCS now. And uh, again, a major, major amendment in this budget on uh, foreign trade. Section 5454F benefits for reinvestment of uh, long term capital gain in purchase of or construction of residential property. Well, uh, it has been explained by the CBDT that the intention of this benefit under 54 and 54F for investment under construction or purchase of residential property is to promote the real estate sector, the housing and to provide housing for all. However, the intention is not to sell high cost houses right under this benefit so in case uh, you purchase a high cost house and what is a high cost house more than 10 crore rupees right uh, so this limit of 10 crore is fine because uh, 10 crore for any upper middle class person now you know that is a good house which you can buy in 10 crore rupees so, the benefit of 5454F for relief from uh, the taxability of capital gain under 5454F by purchase of residential property would be limited when the property value is 10 crore rupees, right? Uh, possibly this would uh, kind of... Uh, disincentivize sale of very high cost houses but then again those who are purchasing very high cost houses hnis whether they would bother about these uh, reliefs uh, while purchasing the houses that is uh, to be seen well last budget we saw that uh, where the premium on ulips paid was more than 2 lakh rupees and the income on such ULIP was received, then the income on such ULIP was, uh, you know, provided as an exemption under 1010D to the extent of those uh, contracts where the premium paid was not more than 2 lakh rupees. That same thing has been introduced for life insurance schemes also. So, in case you purchase uh, one or more, life insurance uh, policies where the total premium paid is more than 5 lakh rupees in a financial year 
on aggregate of all the policies then you will get a relief under 1010d when you are receiving an amount on the these insurance policies limiting the amount received on those contracts or part of contracts where the premium paid is up to 5 lakh rupees in the previous years right so in case you have paid a premium and you have received a amount on the redemption of the such policy of uh, you know you have paid a premium of 6 lakh and you have received say 60 lakhs then such 1010d uh, would be available only to the extent of 50 lakh proportionate to 5 lakh rupees of premium paid on aggregate of all the policies but hold on this is not applicable in case the premiums are uh, paid and the amount is received on death of the concerned uh, insured person <laughs> well uh, this is a uh, Righteous, I would say a fair amendment. Well, in case of amount borrowed on loan taken for the purchase of a house property, a dual deduction was taken by some assessees on the interest which was paid on the amount borrowed. First deduction was taken under uh, ATC right uh, or under income from house property under 24 and thereafter when they were selling such houses then a further deduction was taken as a reduction of this interest from the cost of acquisition of such house property while computing the capital gains now it has been provided that uh, such reduction in the cost of acquisition while computing capital gains for this interest would be provided only in case such uh, benefit of exemption was not taken uh, previously under income from house property or deduction under chapter 6a right right uh, one of the most important uh, disputes that dispute has been further uh, aggravated. I am sure all of you who are uh, in industry, who are into the tax department, finance department, I am sure in case you are a consultant, uh, your clients would have queried on this EDS under section 194R. And your recipient clients would have queried on the income on under section 28.4. So, what is 194R? It was introduced in the last budget, wherein it was provided that in case you receive any benefit in cash or in kind, then such benefit or perquisite would be levable to TDS, subject to TDS at the rate of 10% under. 194 capital R. Correspondingly, the recipient of the benefit of perquisite would uh, have to offer such income for taxation under 28.4 under the head income from PGBP. Now, the question was whether, uh, you know, this benefit would have been only in kind or cash or in kind or both. It was clarified that it would be both. However, how can you treat a cash payment as a benefit, right? If you treat a cash payment as a benefit, then uh, everything, all the payments in business profession that would be treated under 194R, even contractual people, if you hire a contractor where TDS is 1% or 2% under 194C and you pay cash, wouldn't it be recognized as a benefit or perquisite? In my opinion, yes. A major dispute was on discounts. So it was clarified that sales discount, cash discount, and rebates only would be excluded from 194R TDS. However, 
even discount friends i am repeating even pre sale discounts would continue to be as taxable under 284 in the hands of the recipients again many of the field officers we have spoken to they are very very clear and so it seems now after this budget that uh, post sale discount friends even some of you uh, I, you know i can see even if you are in your indirect tax department please note this would have uh, gst implications also in case you provide a post sale discount then circular 12 of 2022 issued by cbdt relaxing 194r on discounts may not be applicable on this post sale discount and tds under 194r may be applicable now after explanation of 2 to 194r is inserted it is clear that uh, even cash payments would be considered to be as benefits so this would uh, further proliferate the litigation which we can all foresee under 194r and 284 so all of us who are in organizations for our clients we need to do a due diligence under 194 capital r and 284 be very clear that uh, this would come up for uh, big time litigations and now the finance ministry has further clarified it stand in the budget yesterday that even cash benefits would be considered to be as benefit or perquisite well few other amendment in direct taxes before we quickly go on to indirect taxes uh, a new authority jcit appeals is uh, formed to take up the case some of the cases below a certain threshold which is pending at the cit appeals level now some cases could be transferred to jcit appeals new cases could be allocated to these new jcit appeals previously i think in 2000 there was some uh, authority of dcit appeals but now this has been uh, that was like done away with in 2000 now this new authority of the jcit appeals is uh, proposed to be introduced transfer pricing assessments you will not get any more time to submit further documents to submit further documents in case of tp assessments the time provided was 30 plus 30 days now it will be 10 plus 30 days so only 10 days to provide documents under tp assessments okay no requirement of pan under 192a for tds for uh, you see for pf by employer scz proceeds to be brought into india within 6 months or as provided by the rbi to be available as a deduction under 1010a is aa and the section 245 we have all dealt with 245 wherein certain refunds are debited in case certain demands are due now 245a subsume 241a in case you get a notice under 1432 or any other notice and in case the assessing officer feels that certain refunds should be blocked till the time such notices are kept open even then the refund can be blocked under 245 instead of 241a right so scope of 245 has been increased just like last budget major amendments in trust repayment of loan or deposit we all know in trust repayment of loan is considered to be as a date of application of the loan not the actual date of utilization of the loan for the purposes of the trust now you have to repay the loan maximum 
or you have to reinvest the amount under the corporate deposit or donation maximum within five years. After five years, the loan amount would never be available as a application. So now the question is, in case you want to extend the loan for more than five years, you have to repay back and then retake the loan in case required. Form 9A, in case of a trust under 12A or in case of 1023C, any institution claiming exemption, Form 10, they were required to be filed by the return date. Now they are required to be filed two months before the audit date. So one month before the return date. No updated return for trust, right? You know, uh, many of the litigations give are raised by the good uh, planning or imagination of the taxpayer. So now in case of a trust, in case you don't file your return by the due date, then you don't get the exemption, right? However, some of the taxpayers after the updated return scheme was introduced, they claimed that in case an updated return was filed, then after all the payments under the updated return, the return for the trust would be regularized and at least the exemption would be available. So friends, uh, these are all, uh, you know, the major amendments under uh, the direct taxes uh, proposals. Before we take on to the queries, one major amendment, as I discussed in the beginning of this uh, session in GST, you would have all uh, read by now. No more uh, availability of input tax credit on goods or services which have been procured for the purpose of expenditure which is mandated to be made in terms of section 135 of the Companies Act 2013 for corporate social responsibility purposes. Well, this issue was under uh, debate from the last five years under GST. Now it has been settled, which is uh, unfavorable to the taxpayer. However, at least uh, the litigation will be settled in this area in GST. But we need to see whether this would be challenged going forward in the courts. In income tax, a similar amendment was made in 2017 uh, by introducing explanation to section 37, wherein it was provided that uh, expenditure which would be incurred as uh, CSR expenditure would not be allowed as a deduction under section 37 of the Income Tax Act. However, mind that even in income tax today, you can claim your CSR expenditure to the extent of deduction under Section 80 capital G. So if you are incurring your CSR expenditure and uh, providing a donation, uh, you can claim the benefit of 80 G for CSR expenditure to the limit specified under 80G, right? However, under GST, your input tax credit is gone. Friends, uh, under GST, it would not uh, mutatis mutandis apply just like in income tax. Because in GST, the expend, the ITC is available for furtherance of the business. Even in case, as was argued by the authorities in income tax, you consider CSR expenditure as an appropriation of uh, profits. Even then, if it is done for the purpose of furtherance of the business, it should the input tax credit for such expenditure should be available. 
So to that extent, let us wait and see after these provisions are notified as to what remains of the CSR expenditure. Further, let us uh, see as to how about the old expenditure under CSR, which has already been uh, incurred under GST, whether the ITC is allowed by the department, not allowed by the department, many of them are in courts already. Certain other uh, you know, amendments have been proposed uh, in the CGST and IGST Act. We have discussed that uh, threadbare uh, in our last colloquium. You can go through our video, which is available on our YouTube channel, even on Will GST, it is available. Our uh, last colloquium's video is there where we have discussed uh, all the important uh, recommendations of the 48th GST Council meeting in terms of deletion of provision to section 12 subsection 8 of the IGST Act for outbound export freight place of supply or decriminalization of GST uh, you know act etc so uh, i think these are the major announcements in the budget yesterday for direct taxes and indirect taxes in customs many rate changes are there the primarily the rate changes are uh, to increase the G customs rate for produce the the finished goods and to reduce the customs rate for raw materials to promote make in india that was expected as per the trend of the government uh, already you can go through the rate changes in customs which are applicable from Today, which have already been made applicable from today, 12 1 a.m. So, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would take uh, the questions. Okay. I would go from top to bottom. There are many questions. Mr. Kaushik Kumar Mandal says, sir, what about ATCCB NPFs not available under the new tax regime? ATC is also not available under the new tax regime as a deduction. Under the new regime standard deduction, irrespective of the amount and enhanced exemption limit at 3 lakh will be applicable. Yes, absolutely. It would be applicable. Under old regime, exemption limit continues at 2.5 lakhs, yes, for other than senior and uh, super senior citizens. The, under the old regime, the threshold limit of exemption continues at uh, 2.5 lakh rupees. Mr. Vipin Loda says if payment to MSME related to CAPEX and payment uh, not done within the period how is it disallowable under 43b yeah to that extent uh, 43b would not uh, prevail as of now mr badri says is the deduction only as of 31st march or for every invoice payment it is every invoice payment but uh, you see income for income tax purpose how when do you crystallize all your deductions that on 31st March itself, right? So, in case uh, you have not paid uh, to the MSMEs as per uh, fifth, Section 15 of MSME Act, by 31st of March, to that extent, you add uh, back such amounts which was claimed as a deduction. And then you claim it back under 43B in the next financial year. Mr. Nilesh says 43B disallowance is to be tax checked as on 31st March only or violation of credit period or every payment. I think I have explained this. Leave encashment is leave encashment exemption available to new tax uh, regime? No. Ms. Geeta Karni, are you allowed interest paid on housing loan to be included in the cost of acquisition till 31-324 as the current says? No, no. It is available, it is applicable from assessment year starting from 1st of April 2024. So it is the deduction is available only in 31st March 2023 
for the assessment years 23 24 uh, yeah mr dandania says if an existing unregistered charitable trust now applies for registration whether its income for past years would be taxable and notice under 148 uh, will be issued see uh, of course yes in case you are not registered right as per provisions of 12a or 1023c then uh, you would be considered to be as a normal assessee and assessed as per the provisions of the trusts we want to know whether 50k standard deduction under the new tax regime is it from one or income above 15.5 lakh it is from rupee one that 15.5 lakh in the finance minister's speech was a little confusing but standard deduction is linked to 16.1a and therefore it is available you know from the beginning 15.5 lakh in the finance minister's speech in fact uh, yesterday when i read and uh, you know just after the budget uh, you know the media conferences were there media was asking questions then uh, on the basis of the speech even i was under the impression that it is applicable only after that but uh, that 15.5 lakh was only to provide you the calculation as to how you will gain 52500 rupees if your income is 15.5 lakh rupees to that extent uh, it was mentioned over there mr gyan says this section igst act 128 now place of supply is gst and of billing it is section 128 is amended to delete provision to 128 however it will be notified after it is passed by 50 percent or more of the state legislative assemblies and therefore as of now the place of supply will continue to be foreign territory 96 mind that another twist you way you can go to our video on our youtube channel and you can see we have discussed please do not put place of supply as 97 other territory otherwise your recipient will not get the input tax credit mr mazumdar says his leave encashment and home loan interest deduction available under uh, new regime no mr doshi who can opt for composition under igst it is only for goods or available for services also it is available for services also but there is a special provision for composition for services mr palani well raja says uh, if old regime can follow in the next assessment year also or we must switch to new regime no option for old regime is there but new regime becomes the you see default it will automatically pop up and therefore you need to see whether you need to fall, file that form 10 ie also mind that the old regime for non salary taxpayers you can shift from old back to new and to and fro only once in a lifetime so you must take a conscious and uh, informed decision mr dinesh todi says whether time limit under 15 bab for incorporation of new manufacturing domestic company also extended one more year yes we discussed uh, time limit uh, no no under 15 bab no atiac yes Mr. Dandaria says where an unregistered trust is taxed as a normal assessee. When an unregistered trust is taxed as a normal assessee, whether amounts paid by it would be deducted from voluntary contributions received by it or the voluntary contributions was taxed as gift under section 56. Uh, Mr. Dandaria, actually, see, there these are two aspects, right? First, voluntary contributions. You have to understand in what form you are receiving those contributions. If you are receiving it as if you are registered, then of course you are right. It would be taxable under 56 as gift. And thereafter, you have to see whether it would be applicable as a expenditure. 
it would be eligible as an expenditure and then you have to take a call. So these are two different transactions. Uh, Mr. Mazumdar says, is the amendment in section 154 for rectification petitions? There are few amendments under 154, but uh, which are uh, linked to other amendments under 143.1, etc. But no specific amendment to 154 as far as uh, I have seen. So, uh, okay, last uh, Mr. Ramanujan says uh, in respect of insurance policy taxability of proceeds would apply only when the policy procured after 1423 onwards correct yes sir absolutely you are correct it is applicable only when policies are procured post 13 1423 yeah new regime no hra deduction is available under 1013a so uh, I think all the queries are done. Thank you very much, uh, all the participants. Thank you for your patient hearing. And uh, over to Samir. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you so much for extensively covering all the you know topics and the amendments and the, uh, clearly explaining the implications. I have a small. Um, some, it is not a query, it just came to my mind. Uh, last year budget, there was a mention of, uh, uh, you know, SEJ, the act was done away with and the Desh was supposed to, you know, be, be, to see the light of the day. But uh, almost one year is gone, no, no Desh, no bill, even no mention of that in this budget. So, any thought on that? Yeah, yeah, lots of thought on that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, is in the pipeline from the information which I have received. This is uh, in high priority in the CBIC in ministry. Also, the the reaction, the, the consultation is being done with the various field officers on the DESH bill. However, and it was also in the pipeline to be announced something, some announcement was to be made in this budget, but possibly further amendments are being made in that DESH bill. That is why it was not introduced in this budget. Possibly something would come and post the budget on this DESH bill. But as far as I understand, uh, you know, that DESH bill is quite uh, in the high priority of the ministry as of now. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating, uh, you know, for your participation on this session. And we continue to uh, we'll continue to have this more often uh, as uh, we already do every month. So as and when there is something important comes from the department, we'll def definitely see you around. So till then, have a nice day. And thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks. Thanks, Samir. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Samir, sir, for uh, coordinating with us. And uh, thank you, uh, Vivek, sir, for this wonderful deliberation. Thank you, all the participants, for attending the webinar. We uh, conduct such webinars every month, and we hope we will get you in the upcoming webinars as well. We will shortly share PPT and video link to all the participants.